100 years, Americans have hung gold star banners in their windows. Silent reminders that while many families serve, only some sacrifice. The gold star represents a family member lost in service to our country. For an apartment complex at I-25 in Hamden, the gold star banner represented just another violation, like a plastic pink flamingo on a patio or a rusty grill on a balcony, something to be swept out of sight in the name of uniformity, at least until our Steve Steger called. You've heard this story before. I received a note that said I was in, um, I wasn't in compliance with their rules and that I would receive a $75 fine if I did not take it off immediately. Someone fighting an HOA or a landlord over a flag. I and mean, it turned out that what was the problem was my gold star flag. The apartment wants it taken down. In this case, it says it messes with the uniform nature of the exterior. And as soon as the news calls, then Veranda High Point changes its mind. I went from, you know, hey, maybe we can actually work something out, even though for the past two months we've told you that's impossible, into saying, hey, it's fine if you leave up your flag. Which gets us back to the important part of this story. The reason Nastasha Perez wants you to see this. It's mostly a thing that everyday peop other people can forget. You know, you don't forget that your father isn't there but other people can. Staff Sergeant Laurent J. West was a family man who shared his passions with his two young stepdaughters. He was kind of the nerd that I was as well. That's why I have, like, I have his predator mask. And a man with a burning desire to serve. <sighs> he felt like he needed to be there. Deployed to Iraq in 2007, his mission said a lot about who he was. He was really excited that they were building schools um, for girls in Iraq, and they were some of the first schools that those girls would be able to go to. You know, I was in college, my sister was doing really well in school, and that he was going to give that chance to, to other girls, and that was really important to him. A noble mission cut short. The IED exploded and killed him instantly. And just like that, Nastasha and her family became part of another. Like we are a gold star family and it sucks. Sometimes we wish that we weren't, but that's what we are and that's the reality. Reality that will remain in her window for the rest of us to see and remember. We're his legacy and we want to keep it um, as alive as possible and have people know as much about him and what he did. Now, the management company in charge of Veranda High Point says this was never about a message against the vets or against military families, or anything like that. It was only about the written rule, which they've decided to overlook in this case, Kyle. <laughs> it's just astonishing how fast it flips from like, this is your last notice, you're in deep trouble, lady, to, oh, hey, we love the vets. I mean, we've seen this script before. We have. All right. Steve, thank you. Take it from somebody who's on Twitter all day. It's kind of a cesspool. A pool that President Trump splashes in happily, along with so many of us, blocking the people who talk trash. Federal court ruled this week the president actually can't do that. It is a First Amendment thing when it involves the presidency. Got us wondering, who's gotten under the skin of our local politicians so bad that they got blocked? Here's Marshall Zellinger. At South Stands 303 on Twitter had a very familiar theme when tweeting at Mayor Michael Hancock in 2012. Hookers, hookers, hookers. I was engaging him about the, uh, the Denver players escort scandal. Hancock won his first election while having to answer allegations that he patronized prostitutes. Seven years later, he has never wavered in saying he did not. A politician is under no obligation to have a Twitter presence. But if they choose to, they should not pick and choose from whom they receive feedback. Colin Daniels is a blogger, a podcast host, and used to tweet critically of Denver's mayor until he was blocked. Aside from threats to physical safety and four-letter word insults, no, I don't think there's any justification to block somebody um, if you're a public official. Nine Wants to Know requested from Denver's mayor and Governor John Hickenlooper the accounts they have blocked on social media. Governor Hickenlooper has blocked 65 people on Facebook, but none since 2014. Mayor Hancock has blocked eight on Facebook and 29 on Twitter. Our own review of the handles blocked show tweets about the escort scandal and homeless sweeps. The mayor's spokeswoman today said, we don't block based on topic discussed. Blocking is typically due to reoccurring profanities, obscenities, and 
racial slurs. The politician has a First Amendment right as well, but I don't think that can trump your First Amendment right to say what you believe, as long as you're not being disruptive or using foul language or something along those lines. The Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition fights for public access like people like me because I'm a victim too. A state senator has blocked my access at Capitol Cowboy. State Senator Randy Baumgartner, about a month after I tweeted from the state capitol the unsuccessful attempt to expel him from office, I noticed at Capitol Cowboy no longer was on my Twitter feed. In a text exchange today, Kyle, he told me, quote, could have been a mistake. I love the news. <laughs> You gotta try being nice to these politicians like I am, Marshall, then you won't get blocked on the Twitters. Thank you, sir. I wish we still did that segment on whether the A-line was working, because today, the answer is a big fat nope. Well, maybe it's sorta, I don't know, I would've gone with nope. A train quit doing a train stuff near Colorado and 40th, so it's just sitting there, dead as a doornail, while mechanics work on it, and then the other trains use that other track to just kind of skedaddle on by. This means 30-minute delays each way. And as always, next viewers on these trains giving us non-stop A-line reports, Andrew Carrillo says his train was delayed right at the Peoria station, so about half the people on board bolted and found a different way to get where they were going. The University of Northern Colorado is concerned that the federal government is slow walking applications for financial aid, forcing more and more students to provide more and more documentation. UNC says this is happening at an alarmingly high rate. Our Nelson Garcia found the Department of Education readily acknowledging it is doing things differently. Office of Financial Aid, how can I help you? At the University of Northern After Colorado. Hours, there'll be a link for you to just sign the master promissory note. Shyla Mars has been fielding calls she rarely took before. That's what the majority of my calls are. I would say like a 98% of my calls um, have to do with verification of some sort. Verification. Uh, this is the, the FAFSA website. Financial aid director uh, Marty Samaro says when families fill out the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA, the U.S. Department of Education sometimes asks for verification. It's kind of like an IRS audit but for the FAFSA. But this year um, just it was an absurd number of students who are being put through this process unneedlessly. Samaro says the number of verifications for UNC students went up by 41% compared to last year, and it's mostly low-income students, raising concerns. But from the idea that these extra steps, these extra burdens that the students face in an already complex process may make them want to give up and not uh, try to go to school at all. The U.S. Department of Education says the filing season opened three months earlier, creating a rush of early applicants. New information was needed that was never required before, and info from the IRS was not readily available. But in the end, a spokesman says the verification rate will be about 30 percent, the same as in prior years. Is it, are you an athlete? Tell that to the one taking all the calls. People don't like financial aid, to be completely honest. They just think um, it's, it's very much so a hassle and things like that. And then with the influx of verification, it has not helped. For next, mm -hmm. I'm Nelson Garcia. Bye-bye. A Department of Ed spokesperson says they're going to reduce the number of verifications required. Try to bring that rate back to normal. South Adams County firefighters will be riding with Adams County Deputy Heath Gum. New fire truck was dedicated today to the deputy who was killed in the line of duty in January. It was Gum's father who set his son on a path to service. Jim Gum is a retired West Metro Fire Rescue firefighter. We're very honored to have Deputy Heath Gum uh, name on it. And um, I know everybody's very familiar with uh, Deputy Heath. Uh, he uh, was a familiar face here, uh, not just because of all the calls of service that we ran with him, but also uh, from the hockey team. Uh, Deputy Gum loved hockey. Um, a lot of the guys at this firehouse played hockey. Um, so Heath was, uh, Heath was a familiar face. Uh, and today we also witnessed a tradition at South Adams where the incoming rig is washed down with water from an old truck that's going out of service. We are more than happy to debunk your conspiracy theories here, like the one this week that there is some kind of nine hidden in the rock background behind me. People sent us a stack of photos with stuff circled as proof, but I'm telling you, we don't see it. There are no hidden nines. We're focused on serious journalism around here, not wasting our time and yours hiding nines throughout this broadcast. Come on.
Coloradans will be getting baked this weekend by the sun. It's a forecast reference. Your next question wonders where Colorado's robins went this spring and will meet a man who has many teenagers dream job. The main goal of my job is to basically use any kind of video games or technology just to make life easier and uh, more normal for the kiddos here in the hospital. That's next. just hours from the weekend and it looks really good. Today we're tracking some strong storms out on the far eastern plains already moving into Kansas. High pressure setting up camp over the area and that's going to keep the storm track to the north of us. So while our high was way above average today, we'll go warmer tomorrow and into the 90s for the weekend. Storms are tracking east southeast into that severe thunderstorm watch area in extreme eastern Colorado. It's out till about 9 o'clock. But tomorrow high and dry, fair skies statewide. California storm brings rain to our west, but for us, all that moisture up and over the top of the ridge, leading us to just enough for maybe one or two high base foothill storms. But lower elevations will be clear tonight, sunny tomorrow, and downright hot heading into the weekend. Kind of a preview of summer for the unofficial start of summer. Mid 50s tonight, close to 90 tomorrow for the Memorial Day weekend. Low 90s Saturday, close to that number Sunday. Slight chance of a thunderstorm late in the weekend with scattered thunderstorms on Monday afternoon. Right now, it doesn't look like anything too severe. Our next question comes from the Eaton family. Where are all the robins this year? Are they also being priced out of the market? So new construction could be the culprit here, although the local Audubon Society says, depending on where you live, the robins might not be there because they lost their favorite tree or a feeder, or maybe there's a new hawk in the neighborhood. The Audubon Society says, robins are not just a spring thing in Colorado. They stay year round. They're out eating berries in the winter. We just tend to see them more in the spring when they, they dig the worms out of our yards. We take a trip to Children's Hospital Colorado next to meet a guy who is paid to play video games with kids who are stuck in the hospital. And a throwback Thursday about a day that a lot of things changed around here next. get paid to do all kinds of interesting things. Stuff that makes you go, that's a job? Like a guy at Children's Hospital Colorado, not a nurse or a doctor, but he's all about making kids feel better. Nine News photojournalist Brian Wendland met Children's Hospital's child life gaming and technology specialist. Here we go. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Normally, you might not associate this with a hospital. No, I'm a fan. The struggle to finish first in Mario Kart. I was an eighth earlier. But normal is exactly what Michael Kundra is trying to give the kids at Children's Hospital Colorado. The main goal of my job is to basically use any kind of video games or technology just to make life easier and uh, more normal for the kiddos here in the hospital. Officially, he's the hospital's gaming and technology specialist. I got zapped. Unofficially. Trying to beat you. He's a new friend for kids like Consuela Martinez. You're a nice place. <laughs> any kind of game, it just really helps kind of get them into a better headspace and make them feel that they're not trapped in this place that they don't want to be. His job isn't just gaming. It's figuring out how to use all kinds of technology to help kids here. All right, can you see yourself? Like using virtual reality as an escape for kids so sick they can't leave their rooms. It almost feels like you're in Disney World on one of those crazy 4D rides or something. Oh no. <laughs> the hospital applied for a year long grant from a gaming charity to fund this position after video game requests came pouring in from families. <laughs> for now, 
that means Michael's job is temporary. It's just a part of their normal everyday life, so make it, making it part of their normal everyday health care um, experience just makes sense. Michael's boss, Chris Coleman, says the program is working and he wants to make it permanent. I'm super grateful and very privileged, honestly, to have this job, I love it. Whether he sticks around for a few months or years, Ooh, there you go. Michael is oh, determined to make life as normal as he can for these kids. Looks like you're good. For next. You crashed, that's okay. I'm Brian Wendland. If Michael's position becomes a permanent one, he wants to recruit some gaming volunteers to have fun and help out the kids at the hospital. On this Throwback Thursday, we kick it back to 1995, the summer that this channel here, good old Channel 9, went from being an ABC affiliate to an NBC affiliate. Channel 4 was NBC, became CBS. Channel 7 was CBS, became ABC. If it is confusing to you now, imagine how confusing it was 23 years ago. When you turn on the tube July 3rd, you will probably have to develop some new viewing habits. You will be switching back and forth because the giant TV watcher in the sky hit the remote that controls the Denver TV market. Channel 9, the ABC affiliate, will carry NBC programs. And Channel 4, the current NBC station, will become CBS. Channel 7, which is now the CBS affiliate, will carry ABC programming. All of the stations will make the switch at the same time and on the same day and likely it will happen at midnight on a Sunday night. So what does this mean for you, the TV viewer? Here's some answers to questions about what will happen when the channels change. No Emerald City, what's doing, what's happening? <laughs> Not bloody likely. Will Nine News still have the same newscasters? Yes, your local news will stay the same on the same channel number. So expect to see Ed, Adele, Mike, Ron, and the rest of the Nine News team right here giving you the best in local news. Oh, Zapolo's stash when he was all dark like that gives me life. The most Colorado thing we saw today was actually spotted in Finland. But you know, sometimes you spot things hidden where you'd least expect them. That's next. Colorado thing we saw today was spotted this afternoon in Helsinki, Finland. You have to look closely at the text there. My buddy Chris is over there today. He texts, he goes, you're never going to believe this. I'm drinking at a Tommyknocker bar. You know, the brewery out of Idaho Springs. They opened up a tap room in Helsinki in 2015. Chris walks out the door and he goes, well, this place is right next to Bar Bronco. It's a little slice of Colorado all the way over in Helsinki. BP writes in, says, I disagree with you that a family with a service member doesn't sacrifice anything unless that serviceman gets killed. That certainly was not what we were trying to intend. We were noting that everyone who serves sacrifices, but some families sacrifice all. Natasha, who is the woman that you met in that Gold Star story with Steve, actually wrote to us just a moment ago and wants to thank everybody in the community who reached out to her when she explained her plight on Twitter and thanked everybody for their support, their ideas, and their offer of help. She says, my family and I are beyond thankful for all of the help. Jenny and Dennis write in, and they say, Kyle, if you're going to show us nine examples of nines, it looks like you came up short. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, fine. Maybe we were one short. We couldn't come up with one more idea. I'll see you next time.